So this is a uh, uh, was not a regularly scheduled uh, Sapir uh, call. Um, we are as so many um, so many publications and particularly publications in the Jewish world are we are responding to uh, to an emergency that um, that is um, unlike anything any of us has seen uh, in history and that would include uh, 1973. I just did the math. 1,200 Israeli deaths is the proportional equivalent of 43,000 American deaths. That is 14, more than 14 9-11s. Over 100 Israeli hostages is the equivalent of 3,700 American, uh, Israeli hostages equivalent of 3,700 American hostages. There were 52 hostages uh, in Iran. So we are in uncharted uh, waters. One uh, consolation is that we can start thinking deeply and seriously about them. And so I'm honored to welcome uh, my friend and a Sapir contributor, Rel Mark Gerecht, uh, former CIA operations officer, senior fellow at the Foundation for, Democ uh, for, the, for the Defense of Democracies, to um, talk about uh, where things stand, where they might go in the days ahead, um, and specifically, how does this event connect with a broader picture of Israel's 45-year uh, confrontation with the Islamic Republic of Iran? So, Ruel, thank you for thank you for coming on on short notice My uh, to share to share some some insight. Uh, Ruel, let, let let me start with with this. There was an early report in the Wall Street Journal a uh, day or so after the attacks that uh, this attack had been planned uh, and, in fact, greenlighted by the Iranians. The Iranians later denied it, and uh, the Times reported that American intelligence, uh, I don't know how much that's worth, but American intelligence uh, effectively confirmed the denial. There are rumors, rumors floating around that uh, Persian or Farsi was heard among the attackers, uh, uh, the Hamas attackers, suggesting that maybe the Quds Brigade, the international brigade of the IRGC, was was involved. But those also haven't been confirmed. So, well, based on what you know about the Iranian regime, what do you think is the likelihood of Iranian involvement, participation, green lighting? Uh, and uh, well, let's start there. Then let me let me continue with the follow on questions. Well, I mean, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the relationship between Hamas and the Islamic Republic has grown in recent years. I mean, even Ismail Hania, who is the political head of Hamas, thanked them, uh, thanked the Supreme Leader for the uh, funding an improvement of uh, Hamas's missile program. Uh, we, know, we know that there have been meetings that Wall Street Journal report, I think referenced uh, uh, a meeting last April, which was well known, it was reported elsewhere, in Beirut uh, between the head of the Quds Force, Ismail Khani, uh, members of the Hezbollah and uh, members of Hamas and there are resident uh, commanders of Hamas who are, you know, in Beirut. So, I mean, everything philosophically, spiritually, operationally, they overlap. So I, I have to assume that uh, they had a pretty good idea of what was coming down the path. The Supreme Leader did say, uh, he made a remark before the operation that, you know, bad things were coming Israel's way now. You know, he makes those remarks not infrequently. It's uh, I don't think it's quite like, you know, the commentary that Rafsan Johnny made, which we didn't see uh, before the attack on the American embassy and soldiers in Beirut in 1983, where he was actually bragging about it. He knew it was coming. Um, so I think the odds are very high. Um, I don't know about American intelligence of what they have seen. Uh, they could be just quite punctilious. They could also uh, 
you know, have fallen victim to a deceptive operation. The Iranians do that. I, I must assume that they probably picked up this information, whatever they have, through intercept. I don't think we have anyone in the inner circles, the human sources. So uh, I'm not sure I would give a lot of credence yet. I think we'd have to see more. They'd have to tell us more. But I think it contradicts uh, the vast circumstantial evidence we have uh, that uh, would lead you to believe that uh, the Iranians were instrumental uh, in this attack. The uh, if that is in fact the case, and given how uh, successful the attack was, um, it would seem likely, if not probable, that the Iranians have helped lay defenses in Gaza itself in the expectation of an Israeli uh, incursion. And I, I want to ask you, because there's really an active debate, even among uh, Israelis, about the military wisdom of going in full force uh, now, the prospect that just as, as what happened on October 7th was a nasty surprise, that further nasty surprises uh, are in in store. So, so my, my my question is: Do you think that Israel is wise to conduct what seems like the frontal assault that is about to come, or or is it something that the Israelis just simply have to do? Well, I mean, I, I think they probably just have to do it. Yes, I suspect uh, Hamas is booby booby trapped every square inch of uh, of Gaza. Uh, I don't know if they need Iranian assistance uh, for that uh, type of preparation. Certainly, the Iranians have learned a lot in Iraq. Uh, so uh, I would expect whatever they have learned, uh, whatever material they developed uh, for use against the Americans in Iraq, uh, they have shared that. Uh, with Hamas. And, and they some of the things they might have learned would be, for instance, those munitions that were so devastating to American armored personnel carriers that accounted for such a large fraction of of uh, the, the shaped munitions with... with uh, uh, yes, uh, yeah, at, at, at the pen all the types of penetrating weapons, uh, I think they would also teach them on, on how to put them down, how to... Uh, how, how to remotely detonate them in ways that the Israelis may not be prepared for, that they haven't seen before in their battles with uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon. So I would, I'm sure the Israelis are uh, cognizant of all this, and uh, I don't. Uh, their hesitation is entirely understandable. I think it's a, it's going to be a bloody slugfest. It's going to redound to Iran's advantage. It's going to reanimate the division between Muslims and non-Muslims, particularly between Muslims and Jews. Uh, that's all going to play to Iran's advantage. Uh, I mean, realistically, if the Israelis had the means, I think they would be better off in having uh, going after everybody to go on offense in Gaza, to go on offense in Lebanon, and most importantly, to go on offense directly against the Islamic Republic. But they simply don't have the means to do that. So um, they operationally, I think, are in a bit of a pickle. Um, they obviously don't have any Palestinian force that can replace Hamas in Gaza. I think they can badly damage it. They can kill the leadership if they can get their hands on all of them. Uh, that is certainly worthwhile. Uh, it can fracture the organization, but I'm not sure it can kill it. Fatah is completely incapable. And I, I do fear that uh, the, the, this fight is going to further weaken Fatah's already pathetic grasp of, uh, of, of power uh, amongst the, in the Palestinian community. Do you would you, uh, among other things, imagine that there is? Um, well, let me stay with with the Gaza angle. Given everything that you have just described, um, would the Israelis be wiser to say um, we're going to negotiate the release of the hostages? Uh, you won this round; it won't be forgotten, um, and walk away from it. Or is that? I mean that seems politically impossible at a, at at a moment like this, but it, you know, 
in five years, will Israelis say that was the why that would have been the wiser option? I don't think so, because I think it's just going to whet the appetite uh, of the axis of resistance, to use the Iranian phrase, uh, against Israel. So uh, it will be a huge victory for Hamas. I, I don't I don't think the Israelis have any way out of this slugfest. Uh, I think Hamas was fully prepared for the Israelis to go in. I think they would have they would prefer uh, that the Israelis look at what's before them and back down. I think that's a larger victory for them. But um, I uh, I don't see how the Israelis avoid this. Now we, we they can have arguments once they go in. Uh, you know, do they? How far do they have to go? I mean, obviously the missile factories have gotten a lot better. I mean, that in itself, all by itself, is terrifying. Uh, the capacity for uh, Hamas and Hezbollah to make their own missiles, the type of engineering knowledge that Iran has relayed to them has significantly improved. It's only going to get worse. So this is the taste of the future uh, for Israel. And, you know, occasionally the, the Iranians, uh, you know, when they're uh, let loose their, you know, grand strategy here. And part of that uh, is that uh, they want to see Israel die through slow reverse immigration. Um, you know, the new age is, I think, going to test the Israelis like they've never been tested before, particularly those uh, who are well-educated, uh, mobile, and can go anywhere in the world they want. What a cheering uh, thought. One of the um, let, let me ask you about the uh, possibilities that this goes beyond Gaza. I mean, yesterday, if there was a moment, you might have experienced it of a what turned out to be a false alarm when it seemed like there was some kind of aerial invasion from the north. Uh, but it's clear that Hezbollah is testing the Israelis uh, in the north. Uh, there is a vivid possibility of Hamas activating cells that either infiltrated Israel from Gaza or that are active uh, in the West Bank. How do you assess the prospects of of this expanding very rapidly to a multi uh, front war? And and is that in Iran's interests? Would 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 they want that to happen, or or would they rather just allow this to remain contained in Gaza? Well, first, I, I suspect that for the Iranians, I mean, uh, watching Arabs die for their cause all day is something that uh, they can endure that for quite some time. Uh, you know, uh, the question is, is has 2006 still had, does it still have an effect on Hezbollah? Contrary to what a lot of folks thought at the time, 2006 was a devastating defeat for Hezbollah. Uh, um, the battle that the Israelis and the Hezbollah had at that time. Uh, it had a, uh, I think, a very cautionary effect on uh, the leader of the Hezbollah in Lebanon, Nasrallah. So um, do they remember that, uh, the pain of that experience? And I would say probably for the campaign in Gaza, that's probably going to be the best that you can hope for is something like that, an effect upon Hamas and the militant Palestinians who simply do not want to give up this fight. Um, you know, um, Iran is obviously putting those uh, missiles uh, into Lebanon with the Hezbollah for a cause. They are to be used. They're to intimidate, but I suspect they are to be used. Uh, the question is timing. Um, does Iran feel that this is the right moment uh, to let loose against Israel? That's an excellent question. And I suspect the answer to that is no, it's not essential now that the Hezbollah might not uh, engage uh, full force. Um, it's a fluid situation. I, I, obviously, the Hezbollah exists spiritually, philosophically exists for the fight against Israel. It's quite clear in all of their commentary. Uh, so I, I think we have to be very careful about uh, downplaying that, uh, that philosophical motive. I think we make mistakes all the time when we don't take uh, folks in the Middle East, the radical set, at face value. 
it's a it's a serious error on our part, which we repeat over and over and over again. Let me let me briefly stop to say uh, to those uh, many of you who are listening, there is a Q and A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and as Ruel uh, says things that provoke uh, questions in your mind, please feel free to populate that that box with with your questions, and I'll try to get leave the last third of this conversation to to as many of those questions as I can. An another aspect of this uh, fight is uh, its effects on the uh, Arab world and what up until six days ago, seven days ago, appeared to be uh, impending an, uh, an agreement between uh, uh, Israel and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And it's there, there's a sense uh, that I, I, I'd like to know your view of it. There's a sense that this this operation was specifically timed to destroy that the possibility of that agreement by rousing the Arab street in in Hamas's uh, defense by provoking an Israeli response that uh, makes for a lot of bad uh, imagery, civilian casualties. Is that is the timing fortuitous or 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 or, or not? Um, and what what is the right Israeli response that will impress the kingdom of Saudi Arabia? Is it restraint or is it destroying Hamas? Well, that's an excellent question. I think you probably have to say that there's probably a division in Saudi Arabia on that question. Um, first, I, I would say that it's, I'm, it wasn't clear to me at all that we had a, 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 an imminent uh, deal, normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel. And I, I was actually quite skeptical of that. And I, I still am that that's ever going to occur. Whether the Iranians uh, had that level of skepticism is, is a different issue. So uh, uh, I'm sure that that was a factor uh, and, the, and their green lighting uh, of Hamas's actions, I think it was a factor for Hamas too. Um, you know, it, it, I, they clearly let everyone know that they have a vote, if not a veto uh, in this process. And I think there was enormous uh, naivete on the part of the Americans and the Israelis about uh, this negotiation, these negotiations taking place between the Israelis, the Saudis, uh, and uh, um, um, and the Americans. I, I think we sort of forgot that uh, Iran gets to participate in this process. Um, and I, 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 this is going to be very, very difficult uh, for uh, the Saudi uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Um, he does have to take in consideration uh, the views uh, of uh, at your average Saudi, uh, which I think remain fairly hostile to Israel. Um, this is going to make it much worse. Uh, there's no way around the coming video images that are going to come out of uh, 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 out of Gaza as the Israelis go in. It's going to be ugly. So, I, at at a minimum, I suspect. Um, the diplomatic process is going to be suspended. Uh, it could actually kill it. Um, so um, in that sense, uh, there, uh, it's probably going to be a, a, a pretty clear victory um, uh, for Iran. Uh, and I would just say in general that there's a, the Israelis make a serious mistake uh, by viewing the, the, the sentiments of the rulers in the Persian Gulf and elsewhere in the Arab world as being the sentiments of the citizenry below them. Uh, I think you have to be very careful about doing that. And in that sense, uh, the Iranians might actually have a better grasp on this. They know there's room to maneuver, room to play uh, with uh, the sentiments uh, throughout the region. And that uh, I think it's probably too much to say now that uh, most Arabs have accepted the idea of Israel. I suspect that's not true. Whether most Arabs want to be participate in any, any type of fight with Israel, that's a different question. But the real question the Israelis always have to answer themselves are, where are the young men? Uh, because in the end, that's who decides these things, uh, particularly amongst the Palestinians. Do you have enough young men who are willing to die and who want to continue the fight 
And if the answer to that is yes, then this is simply going to go on. And uh, the Israelis aren't going to get any type of satisfying solution uh, to their problems with the Palestinians or elsewhere in the Muslim world. Uh, game this out in five years. Say uh, Israel has a tepid response. Hamas remains in power in, in, in Gaza. Um, uh, and the Israelis look to Mohammed bin Salman appear to be not quite the strong horse that uh, they looked like just a few days ago. Uh, devastating to Israel or does it matter? I don't think it really matters. I think for Israel, the uh, big question before them is uh, when the Islamic Republic goes nuclear. Uh, that in some ways doesn't change their confrontation with Iran. It certainly makes it a more gutsy process, a more edgy one. Uh, I mean, it's pretty clear now that, I mean, Iran is a nuclear threshold state. Uh, it's pretty clear the Israelis have had numerous opportunities to attack. They've chosen not to. It's clear the Americans have had numerous opportunities to attack. They have chosen not to. So really, it is an issue of when does the Supreme Leader uh, choose uh, to actually test a nuclear device. When that happens, it's going to you know, set off a lot of different other forces in the Middle East. I would expect the Turks to go nuclear. The Saudis obviously want to go nuclear, but they're so far behind. Uh, you know, that process is going to take a very long time. They simply don't have the industrial base. They can't buy. I don't think they can buy the talent up very rapidly. The Pakistanis have already, I think, pretty clearly said they're not going to rent them a nuclear weapon. So um, the Saudis, I think, are out of it. Uh, the, the Saudis religiously just aren't that important in the Muslim world anymore. And that's a, another big mistake the Israelis make. They sort of look at the Saudis as if they still had the religious authority they did when they were, you know, funding uh, Wahhabis. They don't. They're not funding Wahhabis. That's a good thing. But they don't have the religious stature that they did, say, in 1973. So the effect of this, any type of normalization with Saudi Arabia, which I, I don't think is likely, I think we overestimate its impact uh, in, in the Arab world, in the Muslim world uh, uh, also. I, I, I think so, it's, it's that big a deal. Just listening to you, you seem to be giving the impression that Iranian nuclearization is a matter of when, not if. Is, is that right? That's, that's correct. And that there is absolutely nothing that the state of Israel can do to stop it. I, well, they could try to throw the dice. Um, but, I mean, the, the uh, IDF obviously did not want to do it in 2012. Um, uh, I don't know what uh, Bibi Netanyahu wanted to do then. I think Ehud Barak, when he was defense minister under Bibi, uh, wanted to attack. Uh, I think. I mean, but even there. It's, yeah, no, I uh, think that's right. And they were stopped it, by their own. They were stopped by their own people. Uh, now, the Americans obviously did a very forceful play at that time to discourage them. Uh, so you probably have to credit the Americans there for doing their part to stop the Israelis from throwing the dice. Um, the situation is much worse now. Uh, the Iranians have a much more advanced program. Uh, it's better buried. Uh, the Isra Israelis, again, have a problem of means. Uh, they don't have a lot of throw weight. So um, I, I think, you know, the Israelis can always surprise you, but I suspect uh, they waited far too long. And speaking, uh, the Ameri Speaking of the Ameri Israelis surprising you, you know, I think one one of the uh, effects that will be long term uh, about this attack is that it has punctured uh, not only Israeli hearts but a kind of aura of not just invincibility of of basic competence. Uh, given how much you know about Israel's security establishment, intelligence apparatus, uh, did this attack cause you fundamentally to reassess your sense of his, Israel's uh, strengths and capabilities? No, not really. I mean, everybody uh, gets can get sloppy. All right. The question is not whether you can get sloppy. That's just part of human nature. The question is how you recover from it. Mm -hmm. So uh, if uh, during, after this conflict, we see a lot of heads roll, 
uh, in the Israeli military and security and intelligence establishment, then it, it will tell you that the Israelis are grownups uh, and that they are holding people accountable and they will go back and they will review their mistakes and they will learn from them. So uh, I think that's the critical issue. If you don't see that happen, then you have to begin to worry whether the rot is, is deep uh, and uh, Israel no longer has the political capacity to do the unpleasantness to keep its edge. Uh, obviously, and this is another reason why I think the Iranians were involved in this, is the operational security on this was pretty bloody good. Uh, and the Iranians have gotten a lot better uh, with operational security. They've learned through their own mistakes. And they're, they're much better, I, I think, at assessing the capacities of both the United States and Israel. They practice on it. So uh, I, 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 I think the, 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 the magnitude of this strike, its sophistication, uh, strongly suggests uh, the Iranians were involved and that they, uh, they uh, uh, were good teachers. Um. Let's look at the lessons for the United States here. I mean, it, you sense that, I mean, one sense is a kind of a parallel. You had uh, almost a full year of intense Israeli uh, political division uh, that led to readiness issues. This was widely discussed long before uh, the October 7th uh, attacks. Um, uh, Political dysfunction, bureaucratic sclerosis, uh, eye off the ball, uh, and complacency. Um, uh, all of this seems to apply to the United States right now. And so talking to American policymakers, what is the big lesson that they should be drawing from uh, what just happened to the Israelis? Because, I mean, it, it feels like if this could happen to the SEAL Team 6 of the West, Israel, we, we're like the police of Uvalde, Texas. Uh, I mean, so so it seems to me. Are you are you as apprehensive uh, for, are you apprehensive that something similar, albeit in a di very different way, could happen uh, quickly in the United States? Well, I mean, uh, I mean, the United States has the large philosophical question to, to answer, and that is, does it want to uh, even pretend to maintain a form of American hegemony? In uh, so far, I think the answer to that is no, not really. So, uh, I mean, obviously, we have uh, a growing opposition to American interventionism in the Republican Party. The Republican Party is becoming very unreliable. Uh, the Democratic Party, you know, the, the strand of liberal internationalism is not the strongest strand within the Democratic Party. Uh, it's done, uh, you know, decently on the issue of the war in Ukraine, uh, but it's certainly not a, what I would describe as a muscular party comfortable with intervention. The uh, White House's response on the issue of Iran after the attack uh, from Gaza, you know, has not been encouraging. Um, so they are reluctant. To can, take can you say another word about about that last line? It has not been encouraging. Specifically, why? Uh, they they should have come out and said clearly, loudly that the uh, ties between Hamas and the Islamic Republic are damning. Uh, they could take a much more aggressive posture towards Iran. I don't think they've given up the hope, the, uh, I would describe it as an illusion, if not a delusion, uh, that something will break their way on the nuclear question and that maybe just possibly they can continue to try to buy off um, the Supreme Leader's uh, nuclear ambitions, that they won't get a nuclear detonation a test at least before the presidential elections. Uh, so I don't think fundamentally they have their attitude uh, towards the Islamic Republic has changed because of this conflict. Um, that might change, uh, but I think it's extremely difficult for them to go there. Uh, I don't think you get anywhere until the Americans uh, 
say to themselves, um, you know, listen, um, we are not going to stop the Iranian nuclear program uh, and then try to build a new policy around that. I don't, my preference would be for the, the United States to actually uh, preempt. But, uh, you know, I've been arguing the case for American preemption against the Iranian nuclear program since 2002, obviously with no success. So I, I think it's pretty clear the Americans just don't want to do it. It's a bipartisan reflex. Uh, so I don't think you're going to get a coherent uh, American-Iran policy until you can make it a bipartisan Iran policy. Uh, now, I would prefer that that bipartisan policy not be a policy of appeasement. Uh, but uh, this, this, this is an open question. I, I don't think the Americans have a greater desire yet to go back into the Middle East seriously. Uh, now, the good news is, is the American position in the Middle East is actually on, it's, it's actually decent. And the, the question for the Americans is, do they want to apply a bit more muscle? But uh, obviously, the shadow of Iraq and Afghanistan hang over everything that we do. Uh, and I don't yet detect uh, a really serious desire for the, for the United States to get serious about uh, cornering the Islamic Republic, punishing it for its misdeeds. Uh, last question for me before we go to the many questions from the audience. Uh, you've got 350 people on this call. Um, I suspect that the overwhelming majority are um, very uh, concerned and engaged um, North American uh, Jews. Uh, any thoughts for what they should be doing uh, uh, at a moment like this, other than uh, thoughts and prayers? Well, I mean, um, I mean, I, I the real issue, like I said before, is, um, you know, does the United States want to be, again, an interventionist power? So uh, you've got to make that argument. Um, and it's a tough argument to make. Uh, Americans historically have had problems with intervention. You might even say that, you know, post-World War II, America is sort of a blip. So if the United States, if you can make arguments for why sometimes it is absolutely essential for the United States to intervene with military muscle, that the world is better off, and yes, there'll be prices to be paid, but the price, is for, not, the price for not doing it is far greater. So that's the argument. Uh, Israel is a subset of that argument. Iran is a subset of that argument. I would argue they're important subsets, but you have to get the larger strategic question answered correctly. And until you do that, you're not gonna have an Israeli exception. It just, not, it just won't happen. Abby Schachter uh, poses, uh, offers a suggestion. Uh, she says, one recommendation for an Israeli goal, Israel should uh, Israel creates a no man's land buffer zone between Israel and Gaza. Should the Israelis do the same on the northern border? I guess going back to the pre pre 2000 uh, withdrawal, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, technically, there was a no man's land uh, set up uh, around Gaza before this happened. Yeah. I mean, what, what, what's striking is that the uh, IDF was so unprepared for a direct frontal assault. Uh, uh, they just didn't foresee it happening. Uh, so, you know, I'm not, I, I, you know, the same is true effectively with the topography in, uh, and, and the north around Lebanon. I mean, the, uh, the, the issue is, the first and f biggest issue is the missiles. Um, and... Um, that's uh, that's tough because Hezbollah has so many of them. Even if the Israelis go in there fairly quickly and Hezbollah has a great deal of difficulty shooting them all off, and I think that's a real concern for them, that they actually just don't have the capacity to shoot off as many missiles as they have. Um, it's still a big problem because unless you uh, are, unless you're able to occupy that land for an extended period of time, which the Israelis are not, um, then they just restockpile. So it's a, it's, it's a quandary. Uh, Ronald Levy asks, uh, do you see kidnapping, eliminating Hamas leadership in Qatar as a possibility or desired option? 
Um, well, I mean, that do the Israelis have the capacity? I mean, so they certainly have shown a desire of, of volition to go uh, uh, out abroad and to kill Palestinians. Uh, they've done that on on a few occasions. Um, you know, eliminating uh, individuals who are critical to an organization is always essential. That's why the Americans had uh, for years have been going around and killing um, um, Islamic militants connected to Al Qaeda. Um, you know, is it going to solve their problem? No, but I, I mean, the Israelis, I think, are of the view now, and I, perhaps they've actually been of this view for quite some time, that they don't get to solve their problem. And that's the whole idea behind, you know, regularly mowing the lawn, as they say. Um, so I, I think that's the best situation they can hope for is that, you know, they, they keep their opponents off their feet. Certainly an aspect of that is to kill leadership. Zachary Weinstein wants to know, why can't Israel defeat Gaza entirely from the air without a ground invasion? Uh, it just never works that way. I mean, air power just doesn't have that reach and depth. I mean, uh, Americans have been addicted to air power. I think it's fair to say that it is never given the results on the ground uh, that you would want. Uh, there is just a, no substitute from going, you know, house to house. Um, it's 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 how you clear an area. So, um, and you know, the other thing, if you do saturated bombing. Um, you are going to have a lot of civilian casualties. Um, let's see. Um, if the intelligence was insufficient about this attack, how can we trust the intelligence relating to Iran's breakout of a nuclear weapon? I suspect that answers itself, but I'd like to hear it from you. Uh, yeah, I mean... I don't, I, I think it's fair to say if you look at the history of folks developing nuclear weapons that at no time did the CIA have precise information with the exception of the British uh, about when that was going to happen. So um, the notion, if sometimes if you talk to senior administration officials today, they'll say that uh, there still is a red line for the United States and that red line is the construction of a nuclear weapon. Well, historically, we know that that actually means there is no red line because uh, the odds of the CIA getting that lucky are pretty bloody poor. The same is true for the Israelis. Uh, so I, 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 you know, I, I just don't think you're going to ever have that type of intelligence penetration unless you get really lucky. Um, Intelligence is a living organism. People always have to remember that. Uh, like all living organisms, uh, it can be healthy, it can get sick. Um, but there is, a, I think, a, a tendency to overestimate its value always. Um, and the most reliable guarantor of your safety is hard power. It's not intelligence. Um, Carla Singer and Gloria Zimmerman ask parallel questions. Um, which is which uh, relate to uh, the denial of water and electricity to Gaza. Um, is it necessary to uh, for Israel to cut it off? Doesn't it create a humanitarian uh, disaster and ultimately harm the Israelis diplomatically in terms of public opinion? It's an excellent question. Um, I mean, Obviously, the Hamas has stored up um, a sufficient supplies for themselves. Um, whether this is going to somehow turn the people of Gaza against Hamas in an effective way, I don't know, count me skeptical. Uh, I don't know. It's... Um, I mean, I can see them doing this on a short term basis, but I think long term they're going to have to turn the certainly the water is going to have to come back on and they're going to have to return the electricity in some ways. Uh, I just don't I don't see that as probably being a sustainable policy. There may be short term benefits to it and you might want to do it now and then. But I think in the long term, you can't I don't think you can 
starve Gaza into submission. I think that's probably not going to work. Martin Crossell, uh, Crozell, uh, uh, asks, uh, why do both of you believe that in the long run, a PA administration in Gaza or the West Bank will be less threatening than Hamas? Can't you foresee a day when a PA regime does what Hamas just did? Well, I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that Fatah, which is the lead organization of the PLO, has had many very, very bad moments. Uh, and I think it's fair to say the Israelis often view them as unreliable. Uh, they have been involved in operations in the past which have killed Israelis. I think their sentiments are always in doubt. But, you know, as uh, the PA has proven on the West Bank, um, Fatah is less toxic uh, to the Israelis than Hamas is. They're just weak and they're corrupt. And it's very much in doubt, you know, what their real standing is. We don't know that with uh, Hamas either, but we do know the last time uh, there were free elections and 2000 legislative elections in 2006, Hamas won. James Shapiro asks that notes that the U.S. has placed at least one carrier group, possibly two, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Under what circumstances do you think the U.S. would actually use force directly? Excellent question. I don't know. Uh, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, I'm I have a hard time seeing the American uh, Navy being unleashed if Hezbollah starts shooting missiles at Israel. But maybe it's possible. Uh, but um, I don't know. I think that's put out there to, in theory, intimidate. But if it's put out there and something does happen and we don't use it, then we will look even worse. So um, I don't know. I mean, that's a question for Joe Biden. I don't know. It's unclear to me. Ellen Hyman asks, what, in your opinion, constitutes an Israeli victory under these difficult circumstances? 1973 war ended in victory for Israel and paradigm shifts of the region what could be the victory here? I don't think they're going to get any satisfying victory out of this. I think the best they can hope for is they um, they obliterate the Hamas leadership. Uh, they take out most of the missile stockpiles. They destroy the factories. Uh, and then they call it a day. Um, but it's going to be ugly. Um, and um, I think it's fair to say that the Israelis should anticipate, you know, Western opinion, European opinion, global opinion, whatever you want to describe it as, uh, as a, you know, fluid, and it could easily go against them. Um, Marcelo Pachman wants to know, how is the hostage situation going to affect Israeli actions? And how do you think, um, how do you think, uh, uh, and how do you think of the, them in terms of an exchange of prisoners or will it stop Israel's hand? Talk to us about the hostage crisis. I mean, again, it's a good question. I, I mean, the Israelis obviously have a history of uh, doing a lot to save hostages. Um, I would argue probably too much. Uh, in this circ situation, uh, it may be different. I mean, I, I obviously you cannot conduct any type of effective military operation in Gaza if your hands are tied because of the hostages. So uh, operationally, the IDF may have to just assume that all these people are dead. That doesn't mean they won't try to save them if they can get the intelligence, the information to save them. But that's going to be very, very tough. So I think they're probably going to have to operate on the assumption that can't save any of them. Uh, one of the questions here, um, uh, which I think is a good one, is um, yes. To what extent is the six billion released to Iran? Uh, uh, to what extent did the six billion released to Iran play into this conflict? Do you believe the U.S. can claw back those funds? If not, how can they? How can the U.S. monitor the use of those funds? You know, I I, I don't think the six billion probably had any effect on uh, Iranian behavior vis-a-vis -vis this. Um, um, I mean, it's it's a mystery, and the Americans obviously. Uh, 
gave that money, 1.2 billion per hostage, because they wanted it to be a foretaste of a, a new nuclear understanding of diplomacy that would um, essentially buy off uh, the Sup supreme leader's longstanding appetite for developing a nuclear weapon. So, um, and I don't think, as I said, I don't think they're over that, uh, that hope, um, but I doubt it, it had any effect on, uh, on w the level of support or whatever green lighting the Islamic Republic gave uh, to, for uh, Ham to Hamas, uh, visa clawing it back. I think it's too late for that. So it's. I think it's already. I think it's already been distributed to uh, to Qatar. Uh, so I, I. I don't think you get that money back. Mort Weinstein in this connection asks, "Can you speak about Rob Malley?" Oh, um, yeah. I mean. Uh, obviously, uh, Mr. Malley uh, did something that was fairly uh, disturbing. Uh, we don't know yet what that was, but we have to assume uh, that he shared information with someone who was not authorized to receive it, what exactly that information was, but it was sufficiently disconcerting that his very long and good friend, uh, Secretary of State, uh, chose to stay out of it. So, um, you know, um, beyond that, it's really difficult to say. Um, uh, these things take a long time to be adjudicated. And you shouldn't jump to the conclusion that um, Mali's actions indicated any type of treasonous behavior or Mali's actions, or, or even that the information that uh, was released was necessarily in the real adult world damning. Um, I mean, the counter espionage institution in the United States, the way they handle classified information uh, it is not always uh, what I would describe as mature. So it's possible that M Mali's offense could be quite real, but has nevertheless, uh, in some quarters, been exaggerated. We just won't know until we see more information. Um, but, you know, um, uh, Mali has a long history, as do many in Washington of uh, talking to uh, Iranians, Iranians who depict themselves as being connected to the Islamic Republic, even sometimes former officials, maybe even active duty officials. Um, this, this, you know, the second track system has been going on for some time. Um, Mali just may have been given his position in the government, may have been a, perhaps a tad bit too exuberant uh, in reaching out to people that he has known for years and discussing issues that he shouldn't have. And maybe those discussions were picked up on intercept. And so it proved, uh, it proved problematic for him. Uh, Merrill Rutman asks a question I will answer. Who is Rob Malley? I'm assuming it's not an ironic uh -huh. question. He was the Biden administration's chief negotiator with Iran and had been active previously in the Obama administration in nuclear negotiations and going back to the Clinton administration in negotiations with the Palestinians. And uh, he's known as being, I guess, on the far, on the left edge of of the State Department's uh, 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 panoply of thinkers and negotiators and uh uh, I think I think it's fair to say that uh, Rob has a long history of being sympathetic to the oppressed of the third world. Yes. Uh, yes. So, uh, but I would say this in his defense, I don't think he did anything in the Iran portfolio on any of the major issues that weren't explicitly authorized by the president of the United States, the secretary of state or the national security advisor. Um, you know, 
up until about uh, this is a question for me, but it's it, it combines a few questions that I'm seeing in the in, in the in in the chat. You know, up until a few months ago, I think many of us were kind of feeling good that uh, the days of the Iranian regime may be numbered. Uh, do you think that with this event in uh, in Israel, this this horror in Israel, that we should be less optimistic about the impending demise of the uh, Islamic uh, Republic? Has this given it a lease on life or no effect in terms of its domestic political situation? I, I don't think um, anything that has happened recently, which includes uh, obviously the uh, Hamas onslaught on Israel, has made the clerical regime stronger at home. Uh, I do think uh, that the uh, women's movement, uh, the women life freedom movement that started with the death of Masa Amini a, a year ago, um, it has a, it's lost. That the regime was able to recover from a very scary situation uh, that they were terrified of. And uh, their counterattack has has worked. Um, and uh, in an operational sense, you have to admire their audacity. I mean, here you had a regime that did not want to confront its own citizenry, particularly Persians or Azeris, the two primary ethnic groups, on the streets. They were scared to death of actually shooting young girls down in the streets. Yet they went and they poisoned young girls nationwide in schools to intimidate their parents to get these children off the streets. That tactic worked. There are small demonstrations continue, but uh, I think they see, and I think they see it correctly, that the uh, uh, considerable pressure they were under has been dissipated. Now, that doesn't mean that in the future there's another spark. The regime has lived for a very long time now with a fear of an unseen spark, something that hits them and creates a massive wave of protest larger than the security services can handle. That still exists. The Islamic Republic uh, cannot recover a sense of legitimacy at home, which is one reason why they've been more aggressive abroad. The type of legitimacy and approbation they can no longer receive from their own people, they do get, uh, uh, they do get that overseas. Uh, so in that sense, the Trotskyite motivation to uh, send the Islamic revolution abroad is as vivid and alive, I would argue, as it was in the early years of the revolution. It's the only place they get any sense of satisfaction. And it's always important to remember that. It's ugly to say it, but I mean, you know, killing Israelis um, makes them happy. It's just it gives them a frisson. Uh, it gives them uh, it in and that in and of itself um, is, is sustenance. Uh, it justifies the struggle. We are close to the end of time. Well, I really want to thank you for uh, clarity, insight, uh, perception, and uh, an incredible ability to speak in uh, complete sentences and uh, uh, complete paragraphs as well, which I admire more than anything. I want to mention just two things to our audience, and I thank them for tuning in on a Thursday morning. I'm in what I'm sure is the middle of busy, busy work days. Um, there is a live Sapir event uh, coming up uh, next uh, Tuesday at 7 p.m. in person at the Park Avenue uh, Synagogue, and it will be available for streaming uh, uh, live uh, as well. I will be on the stage with Rabbi Elliot Cosgrove and Rachel Fish of Brandeis University to talk about American Jewry, the war in Israel. What do we do uh, now? So I invite you to participate in person or certainly at least on the, on the live stream. And uh, click the link uh, in the chat or go to sapirjournal.org to sign up for our uh, newsletter. Um, we feel the sense of emergency very keenly, and we're trying to um, stay uh, uh, very much in the fray and to provide, to supply ideas for a thriving Jewish future. Ralph, thank you so much for this hour of your time. I'm very grateful, if very depressed. Um, and uh, I thank our 
uh, our audience for being so engaged and attentive and intelligent with your questions. Under the circumstances, I, I hope you have as nice a day as, as you can. All the best.